So the ball turret is probably one of the most unique uh, parts of the plane and one of the heavier focal points for the gunners. But essentially this just is a look at the Memphis Bell's ball turret. So there's a lot of uh, myths about the ball turret. Uh, whilst it is true that there isn't a whole lot of room inside there, and uh, a lot of the times the uh, smallest guy in the crew might move into this position. Uh, however, it is actually quite comfortable. Um, you do kind of go in the fetal position, but because of the gravity, uh, the way you're sitting, it's kind of like sitting in a lounge chair and it doesn't matter whether you're aiming to the back or you're aiming down, you're always sort of comfortable leaning back to the rear and your, uh, your arms kind of just rest on your chest or a little bit above your head while you operate the controls. Essentially in location to the plane's exterior, um, we're right behind a bulkhead that is through to the radio operator's compartment, who's behind the bomb bay, who's behind the pilots. A lot of myths about this position about that it was one of the most dangerous parts of the aircraft are uh, not entirely true. And that's uh, given to a lot of the nature of how enemy fighters actually attack the airplane. And uh, because of uh, trying, to, trying to conduct an attack in a climb rate as the enemy fighter, that's gonna be one of the times when you're moving the slowest. So putting together the, uh, the numbers and the chances of occurrence of that type of attack is actually one of the least vulnerable targets in the plane to fighter attack compared to the waist gunners, the tail gun, the top turret. Uh, so in terms of enemy fighters, uh, he's actually at a lot less risk. However, there is risk, of course, of attack from that. Now, flak, he's probably as susceptible to flak damage as nearly anybody else in the aircraft. Remembering that um, he does have some armor plate under where he actually sits. Although the guys in the waist, up in the nose, they're just dealing with that straight sheet metal. Uh, however, when one of those 88 rounds goes off, as we saw in the plane, that armor plate's a survival chance. There's no guarantees. So he is as susceptible to flak as almost anybody else in the plane. And as usual, if the plane goes down, they all go down. Going into some of the components of the ball turret, uh, you can see quite clearly right at the front there, his heated seating uh, element uh, right between his legs. So he does have access to adjust it in flight. Uh, obviously the two a and 2 machine guns, and you can see a really good shot with the way that this is lit up. He does have those charging handles to um, initially load the guns. And then in case there is any stoppage drill, he can attempt to clear the drill by actuating the charging handle. However, if there's a, a jam up underneath the feed cover, there's very little he can do to clear that jam. Uh, you can see on the sides of the turret here, uh, the chutes where the spent leak and um, spent ammunition would actually fall out of the ball turret. Obvious reasons there is um, up above the ball turret, he's got several hundred rounds, perhaps maybe even a thousand above him. If that amount of ammunition was to accumulate inside the turret with him, it would create immense problems and he would essentially be rendered ineffective after a few hundred rounds. Their ball turret was manufactured by Spiri. Uh, there were several variants and iterations of the ball turret. So not too many variants overall of the ball turret produced. Most noticeably A2 and A2A of the B17 types. The one featured here in Memphis Bell is A2, which would be the earliest style. And that is most notable by the glass end caps either side of the ball turret. Uh, the A2A got rid of those and it essentially became a straight walled, uh, straight glass plate assembly. Probably many reasons why. One of them would be to do with simplicity of manufacture. The only other style of ball turret in um, conventional production would be the A13 which is the retractable style featured in the B-24. So people often wonder what the hell this thing is. Um, and essentially, basically, it's a foot range control unit and it is often mistaken for a linkage or perhaps control unit for the guns. Uh, not true at all. It's got to do with how the ball turret gun arranges his target. 
So very briefly, the gunner identifies the enemy coming through the sights and he sets a target dimension knob on the dial of the sight and that informs the actual size of the target. Then when the gunner is tracking the target, he adjusts the image in the reticle optic head. Vertical lines in the reticle image are close together when the target is at long range. As the target approaches, the reticle lines are moved apart and the target appears larger. The distance between the reticle lines for a target given size is the basis for his range calculation on the site. The reticle lines are moved by a foot range control, which is what we're looking at here and essentially what that does. It's uh, operated by a flexible feed shaft that connects the unit to the site. Get some! Get some! So we're going to talk about a very interesting feature of the ball turret a lot of people might not be aware of. There is actually a risk of uh, perhaps not shooting the plane, but damaging the aircraft uh, with the guns on the ball turret. If he faces the 12 o'clock position at full elevation, uh, he will actually uh, hit the belly of the plane, uh, scar it up, perhaps strip some gears if he really forces it. And then there might be some risk of actually hitting the forward end of the plane uh, with the guns at full elevation. There is actually a mechanism in the ball turret to prevent that from happening. Up in front of the gunner's window, there's a little silver button and that acts like a lockout circuit. And then when you move around to the back of the ball, the front of the ball turret, uh, there's a plate and that plate is actually shaped and concave to the belly and the nose of the airplane. And the way that it works is if the gun is in full elevation and he traverses over that point, the shape of that plate is actually designed to open the circuit on the switch so he cannot actually traverse uh, into the belly of the plane. So what would happen is if he was at full elevation and he whips around to 12 o'clock, he's not going to make it that far. The turret will actually lock out and he'll have to traverse down to pop that switch off the plate so he can continue getting power around the plane. So quite an interesting feature of the ball turret that not too many people are aware of. And then talking about the fire cutoff switch, as you can see here in the wiring diagram, that fire cutoff circuit is what prevents the guns firing when they're traversed over that lockout point marked by the plate shown here in this diagram out of the ball turret manual. So an interesting thing uh, to do with the ball turret specifically for the B-17, not the B-24, would be why is the ball turret typically always found facing the rear of the plane? Well, there's several reasons. Uh, one of them would be <clears throat> once the ball turret is in any other position, you got a lot of oncoming uh, forward wind uh, hitting the side of the turret, hitting the front of the guns. And without somebody on the controls or the hydraulic motor actually engaged to where the traverse ring gear can actually spin freely, uh, that ambient air will always force the ball turret to kick itself to the rear. It's not until you hit hydraulic and that pump is running to keep uh, tension on the gear that you can traverse and leave it into that position. Once that hydraulic motor is off, it'll, it'll basically free spin. So without the lock on, we could get in there right now and push this turret all the way around. Why is that important? This is the stowage position for the ball turret because when you're coming into land, <clears throat> if the guns are at all uh, traversed down, or the turret happens to be facing in a, in a different spot. When they hit that landing, uh, if this turret hits the ground as the tail's coming down, or perhaps even on a hard deck landing when the shocks compress on the landing gear, if this bounces onto the ground and the ball turret actually dislodges, it can fly rearward, uh, damage the, uh, <coughs> the horizontal stabilizers, potentially cause a catastrophic landing accident. So this is the takeoff and landing uh, default position of the ball turret. Another interesting point is, let's say the aircraft has to conduct an emergency landing and we have an issue with landing gear damaged and they need to belly land. There is actually a method of jettisoning the ball turret. So what they would do is they would disconnect the umbilical for power and oxygen, unscrew several bolts from the ball turret to the mount and the ball turret will actually fall clear out of the plane. Uh, last thing, which we've already talked about, is how do you actually get into the ball turret? Well, from the exterior in the default position here, you can see the access door at the rear. For the, for the guy to actually get in, as we mentioned, inside the plane, the guns will be traversed straight down. So right now, 
Uh, the guns are pointed uh, essentially level with the rear of the plane. And then uh, for him to actually get into the turret, uh, a lot of the time he will need assistance. And uh, that'll typically come from the flight engineer. And uh, the important part about the ball turret is this is, uh, again, like every turret that has an electric and a, or a hydraulic, there's also a manual override. Big difference with ball turret is there's an exterior manual override. So for the, for the, uh, the gunner to get into the position, the turret actually has to traverse guns all the way down. And then the, the e entry door will actually appear uh, right here. And then he'll climb down into the turret. But a very important thing to note is this brake right here. So you would uh, unrelease this brake, wind the turret uh, down, open the hatch and get in. If this brake slips, um, all that air wind speed is actually going to want to push the turret and the guns back to the rear of the plane. And even though it's geared, um, that momentum will overcome the gears. If you're getting into the ball turret um, and you're halfway in, and, and the, the brake lets go and those guns flip, it'll cut you in half. Um, so it is a very dangerous uh, sort of risky procedure. So what they did to alleviate that is the flight engineer or perhaps one of the waste gunners would be here. He'll elevate down and he'll hold the elevation wheel and apply the brake while the, the operator gets into the turret, locks it and then he'll tap on the door or radio communications tell him, yeah, okay, we're clear. He'll release the brake and then the ball tower gunner has controls to do his thing. A study was done from November 1942 till December 1943 that studied specifically uh, heavy bombers above Europe for the uh, Army Air Forces and the study was done for medical support and with the goal to consider the crew members in the plane most susceptible to both injury from ground flak and fighter interceptor aircraft and the goal of the study was done to uh, look at which places in the plane would be best suited to add additional armor to protect the crews. Once the study was done, uh, it outlined the most susceptible to injury and death uh, positions within the aircraft. Of the 1,293 incidences recorded between November 1942 and December 1943, the ball turret gunner suffered 78 incidences of wound or death, putting them at only 6% compared to the top 12% total number of losses or incidences within the aircraft, making the ball turret gunner one of the least riskiest places to be stationed within the aircraft. Like every other turret, everything runs on a slip ring, so you have the ball turret umbilical, probably one of the only true wiring harness type setups where everything's cannon plug and single pin. Um, which gets his main power from the aircraft. The B-17 was never designed to have a ball turret in it. It was actually a later modification. So with the first B-17 taking flight in 1935, even all the way up to the D model, uh, the, they never had a ball turret. So some of those problems that you see, such as getting in the turret in flight, uh, limited access to move around, they had to modify the B-17 to accommodate that.